Ch chapter 13 in our textbook. And the first thing that we're going to do uh, is to take a look at one of the problems from the previous homework set. Now, if you look at our material for chapter 13, uh, you'll see that what I'm going to do today is actually going to be a combination of 14 and 15. So it will be labeled lecture 14, but there really isn't going to be a lecture 15. So these two will be together. Then since I will be assigning a little bit more homework, uh, I will shift the due date for the homework until Monday. So those are just sort of some of the, some of the specifics. So if we come over here to the document cam, the first thing I would like to do is to take a look at problem 13.119. And what we have on this problem is an ocean liner, right? And the ocean liner has a mass of 35,000, yes, mega grams. All right, so let's think about for just a minute uh, what this means. Well, this would be uh, 35, this is times 10 to the third if we think about it that way, uh, megagrams, and a mega is actually a 10 to the sixth. So this is 35 times 10 to the ninth grams, but if we want to report it in kilograms, it would be 35 times 10 to the sixth kilograms. So all of those are valid units. All right. So it has an initial velocity of four kilometers per hour, and we may be able to keep that in kilometers per hour, but once again, I'm thinking we're going to want to change it into probably meters per second would be my guess. So we have 10 to the third kilometers per meter, and we have 3,600 seconds per hour. So if we <coughs> do the math on that, to write that number in meters per second, we get 4 divided by 3,600. Boy, that's really slow. How about this? 10 to the third meters per kilometer. That will help. That will be better. I was thinking that is not right. I have something really weird there. I put my conversion fact, I put the value on the other side. So it's 1.1 meters per second. All right. So what the equation looks like is this. We know that in the final analysis that the mass is going to be the same, but the velocity when it comes to a stop is equal to zero. So what we're really looking at is what is the impulse of the force from the tugboat? We're told that the magnitude of the force uh, from the tugboat is 150 kilonewtons. Okay? So that would be 150 times 10 to the third newtons. All right. So basically what we're looking at is the initial linear momentum of the boat plus the impulsive force, the impulse of the force of that tug is going to equal the final linear momentum of the ocean liner. The force is constant, so we can just write that as F delta T. And that those two things then will equal zero. The force opposes the motion or the velocity. So we could then say minus F delta T, or let's say equals, let's say minus F delta T equals zero. And then MV1 will equal F delta T. And what we're searching for is the delta T. So if we take the initial linear momentum and divide it by the force, 
we'll get a delta T term. So let's go ahead and resolve our units when we get this done. So if we have this as 35 times 10 to the 6 kilograms times the velocity of 1.11 meters per second, that would be the linear momentum of the tug or of the ocean liner initially, divided by the force, which is 150 times 10 to the third newtons, is equal to time, how much time it takes it to stop. So what do we know about a newton? A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So if we do this, we get kilograms cancel, meters cancel, this second cancels this, and we have a single, just second, not second squared, but just second in the denominator of the denominator, which will flip that to the top. So numerically, the value is going to be 35 times 10 to the sixth times 1.11 divided by 150 uh, times 10 to the third. So 10 to the sixth divided by 10 to the third is just 10 to the third or 1,000. And so that value is... 259 seconds. Okay, then if you wanted to write that in minutes, because there are 60 seconds per minute, you could say 4 minutes and then 0 0.313166. Hang on a second. Let me just do this. 0 0.3166 times 60 is how many seconds? 18, 19 seconds. 4 minutes, 19 seconds, or 259 seconds, either one. All right? It's a good problem. It's very, very uh, rooted in momentum and impulse. So, and I'm glad I didn't, I, I had told the class uh, today that there's a certain type of problem in this section that does not lend itself well to high levels of understanding. And when the student brought this, problem to me. I was afraid I'd assign the other problem, but I'm good. So we're golden. This is a good problem, which is what I had intended. You have that equation right there, like mv1 plus, is that like the integral of SVT? It is. Right, and it comes from this idea. If you think about everything goes back to this, right? Everything goes back to Newton's second. So then we get force is equal to mass times dv dt. And when we start talking about momentum, even though mass in this form is a constant, we can also think of it like this. Okay? And so then if we separate that, okay? Sorry, I forgot my D. Oh, I guess I got my D there. Okay, so then if we integrate both sides, we get the integral F dt equals, and if the mass stays the same, which it doesn't always, but if it does, we get mv2 minus mv1, like that. So what we're, we're saying then is that the difference in linear momentum is equal to the integral of F dt, and we refer to that as the impulsive force. Or the impulse, see I always want to say that incorrectly, the impulse of the force. So then once again, if F is constant, which is nowhere near something one can assume, but in this problem it tells you specifically, F would come out and you'd get that delta, so you could just say like that. So if you have constant mass and constant force, Newton's second law can be written as just F delta T is equal to M delta V. And that F delta T is referred to the impulse of the force. F is referred to as the impulsive force, and F delta T is referred to the impulse of the force. So, so far so good? Yeah. All right, excellent. So now uh, let's take a look at um, the rest of this chapter, which is about certain kinds of impacts. So let me pull, oh wait, I didn't pull it up. Here it is. All right, let's see if it'll come up properly. Come over here to the podium PC. And we're going to talk about 
Um, oh, we just need to go to the very end of this. We're just going to talk about direct central or direct and oblique impact. So I'm going to use the uh, the PowerPoint lectures today because uh, this is very. I, I don't mean when I say cut and dried. I don't mean easy. I mean that it's it's rich in formulas. So we have to know some definitions, and then we have to. Um, then we have to use particular formulas based on the nature of that impact. So when we talk about impact, it's really common to talk about like pool balls on a pool table hitting each other because it's a great example and also because um, cue balls and pool balls in general are round uh, spherical. There's so much symmetry that you don't have to take into account any lumpiness of the spin. So because they have such a high degree of symmetry, they make a good example. And this first slide set gives us two definitions, a direct central impact and an oblique impact. The difference between them is if with direct central impact, what happens is the two balls approach each other along the same line, which we call the line of impact. Then they will bounce off of each other in, in a way that we'll discuss after um, on the next slide. Oblique impact also has a line of impact, but the balls approach each other and hit each other on the line of impact, but they don't come at each other from the line of impact. In other words, the impact is skewed to the initial velocities, the directions of the velocities of the two balls. So we first are going to start talking about direct central impact, and next we'll talk about uh, oblique central impact. But in both of these cases, we set up our coordinate system so that one of our axes is along the line of impact and the other axis is perpendicular to the line of impact. Now, when you have a direct central impact, the line of impact is not always obvious. So that's something that would have to be teased out of the problem or given to you in the problem. With direct central impact, you can instantly see the line of impact because they just come at each other um, from opposite 180 degree directions and then they bounce off of each other. Maybe not at the same angle if they have different masses and so forth, but, uh, but we, have a different, we have a different configuration with oblique central. It's a little bit harder to identify. They generally, authors will draw a picture showing you where the line of impact is. So the central has to do with it in like this Right. Like horizontal. Yes, exactly. And so we it's always. Kind of like a cue ball that like yes. jumps and hits the top, it wouldn't be that. Right, exactly. Kind of weird thing. We would have to handle that in a different, more complicated way. Yeah. Absolutely. Good question. So, yeah, when you see people doing fancy shots or when they do silly shots, that's definitely not. Yeah, we're just talking about balls staying on the table and hitting each other um, and just having a point where they touch and then bouncing off. They actually use this kind of analysis to determine the speeds of vehicles before a crash. So like if somebody says I was only going 37 miles an hour, they can reconstruct the scene and this is a part of that reconstruction and say, well, actually you were going for 40, you know, you were not going 37, you were going 111, you know, or something like this. So they can do that reconstruction based partly on either direct central impact or oblique central impacts. All right. So here are some different things. We have um, the bodies that move along the straight line where VA is higher than VB. So in other words, this is one type of a central impact where the direction is the same, but VA is essentially going to catch up to VB or ball A is going to catch up to ball B. Ball B. Um, when this happens, it happens with any impact, but there is a period of deformation which depends on how squishy or resilient the material of the two objects are. That's why pool balls are extremely resilient. They have a good, you know, they hit, you hear a click, and they bounce clean from each other. Other things, if you had two lumps of clay, they wouldn't act like this. They would have this period where they would stick together. Um, and then other objects just have a period where they uh, where they deform, My, you may not even be able to see the deformation. Pool balls do this actually, but uh, they def there's, a, there's a slight deformation over some period of time and then they restore themselves to their original shape. 
Right. Uh, the velocity as they part is referred to in most of the equations as uh, u, or sometimes is referred to as v a prime and v b prime. All right. So we kind of have to watch the uh, the symbolism and make sure we know what we're talking about. Generally speaking, the variables v sub a and v sub b are reserved for before the impact. Sometimes it's the most common thing is for u to be the velocity during this period where the deformation has occurred, called the period of restitution, or the period of deformation, where they're in contact with each other. So both balls move away from each other with this velocity u. And then when they separate and f are restored again, the velocities after that occurs would be v sub a prime and v sub b prime. So the, the first equation that we see just tells us that and that the, actually the linear momentum of both balls going in is going to equal the linear momentum of both balls going out. All right, and the, the, the interesting part is that looks really simple, but we generally don't have enough information, so we need another equation, which is where this period of deformation comes in. So what they have drawn here is a ball and then showing what it looks like when it hits the other ball without, they're just showing one of the balls present. So in other words, this deformation, this flattening over here is caused by it hitting the other ball, but we're not looking at both. We're just looking at one. So if we look at this, we can say, we can think about that deformative force as being an impulsive force from the other ball, which is called P. And then it comes away with this velocity U, which is going to be the same for both balls. All right, so then if we continue this, we come up with um, this idea of a coefficient of restitution, which means if we take the velocity during the period of deformation, subtract the final velocity, and divide that by the initial velocity minus that same velocity during the period of, co of restitution, it's going to be a ratio of the integral of the forces involved, the impulses of the forces involved, and it's going to be between zero and one. If, if E is equal to zero, the coefficient of restitution, E, if it's equal to zero, that means that this is a perfectly plastic impact, which means that the two objects will not separate from each other at all, okay? So what that's basically saying is that uh, this value is equal to, is well, the, one of the, this has to be equal to zero. The VB minus U has to be equal to zero. So and, like well, it could be like um, silly putty, uh, right? Like if you just bounce and they're just stuck, that's it. <laughs> that's perfectly plastic. Perfectly elastic means that nothing, no energy is lost in the collision. They clink off each other and the world is a better place, so to speak. But most in real life, Theoretically, you can have zero and one. In practice, you often have zero. You never really get to one. The coefficient of restitution is essentially always some value less than one, but the higher it is, the more elastic that collision is. And the word elastic, um, if you th the, the best, uh, elastic means how much it restores to its original shape. And what I think about is like a rubber band, which is called an elastic band. So if you stretch a rubber band and you let it go back, it goes to the same size and shape and strength until you start to wear it out. So a new stretchy rubber band is quite elastic. All right. And so in that case, now in that case, the total energy and the total momentum is conserved. So the equations that you'll need in addition to um, the ones that we just saw. Let me see if I can go up. Hang on. There we go. So we have this, which talks about the initial and final momentum. We also have an equation that's just talking about the difference in the velocities, the, veloc the difference in the velocities after the, the collision 
is equal to the negative of the difference of velocities before the collision. So in other words, we have to take into account the direction of those velocities. And the other is, is that this coefficient of restitution is equal to the ratio of those, um, those values after, before, and during the period of deformation. Now, a lot of times E will be given to you. E is known for different materials. It's a, it's a property of materials. So often that's how that would, be, um, that would be delivered to you. Now, when we talk about, this is about, if you notice at the top, we're talking about the central impact. If we talk about an oblique impact, like I said, we still use the same axis. We have that line of impact or the N axis normal. And then we have the T, the perpendicular uh, to the line to the um, line of motion. Here we try we resolve all of our velocities along those two lines. So in other words, you do a normal and a T. You won't resolve into I's and J's. You'll resolve into N's and T's. But it's not it's not like circular motion. It's just along those axes. So you draw the axes that are on the line of impact and perpendicular to the line of impact, and then you resolve your velocities into those components. So what we find for an oblique central impact is that the initial velocity in the tangential direction of each ball remains unchanged. Then we, uh, and actually it's true for a direct central impact too, it's just that it's zero because everything happens on the same line. Um, here and in the normal direction, we have sort of a normal, ha ha, uh, equation of conservation of linear momentum equation. All right, and then we also have this equation that involves the VA prime, VB prime, which are after the impact in the normal direction is equal to that coefficient of restitution times the difference of the velocities going into the impact in the normal direction. So the things to remember here, uh, because uh, because momentum is a vector, we always have to keep talking about the direction. We have to resolve carefully into n and t directions in order for these equations to work. The equations still work, x, y, or whatever other set of coordinates you might use, but you don't have this relationship with e to give you another equation. In other words, it will have some piece of e in the different Cartesian directions. Yes? Oh, it's a bracket. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and it's sort of an it, it's sort of an awkward subscripting s scenario. But what they're saying is they want to use parentheses to say V A in the normal direction and V B in the normal direction. So I might just eliminate the parentheses here and just call it V A N and V B N, and then you could just use parentheses instead of brackets. So it's just a second. It's just the second tier of parenthetical. Yeah, good question. All right, so then the rest of this, we just talk about uh, in an oblique central impact. This one's kind of interesting because we have a cart with a very fixed direction because it's on wheels. And unless it makes, unless the ball hits it hard enough to bounce, um, we know that we know what the direction of the cart is going to be afterward, okay? So this is just a way to work out the vectors. Um, so we look at the tangential direction and we look at the normal direction. In this case, we are kind of talking about mixing the two, which is a strange kind of an idea, but it still works. But the big thing to know is that that coefficient of restitution is only applicable in the normal direction or along the line of impact, okay? So in other words, you can't, um, you can't tease out the coefficient of restitution very well, except along the line of impact. Okay? Um, and then you can also combine these with energy and uh, energy problems. So for example, with pendulums, you can talk about, uh, you can use work energy, you can use impulse and momentum, and you can also do um, anything from Newton's second law directly involved in that. So. You can look at, for example, a pendulum as being a conservation of energy problem or conservation of momentum or, once again, conservation of energy. So they all tie together. The only thing executionally that you need to remember is that energy is 
amounts, not vectors, and momentum is vectors. All right. So then um, this is just another type of a problem that lends itself to, uh, to impact. We have a ball that's thrown against a wall and it bounces off, all right? So we, they'll tell you the direction, what the V sub n is, and in this case, uh, the line of impact, because this wall is not moving, the, the line of impact is just going to be basically a horizontal line, and then the tangential direction is going to be perpendicular or essentially vertical. So you can resolve into the normal and the tangential components, and then you can use that idea of the coefficient of restitution, which in this problem is given, uh, in order to solve the angular nature of the problem. All right. And this is sort of a classical problem of an uh, oblique impact. But we have two balls, equal mass, and we have to state that it's frictionless because otherwise we would have to take into account the impulsive force of friction in some manner on this. So they give you a value of E, and you want to determine um, the velocity of each ball after impact. Okay, so when they're asking for velocity, once again, they're asking for the vector velocity. But what they've done here, you may have been able, they have drawn the line of impact for you. So there's always some clue about that in the problem. If it's not excruciatingly obvious, they will have to tell you. And E is something that they will either have to tell you or you can, they will ask you to find. In other words, you have to have enough data to be able to do one or the other. So here, with a coefficient of restitution of 0.9, these are pretty resilient balls. They're not very sticky at all. All right, so they do the same thing. They set up the normal and the tangential velocities of each, and then they use the equation specific to uh, oblique central impact, which is that the tangential velocity of each ball remains unchanged. Then before and after. And then we do the normal equations uh, and we come up with an expression for um, the normal velocities afterward. And then we should be able to use our coefficient of restitution to finish it off and to get the information that we were wanting, which is uh, VA in the normal direction and the tangential direction to write a complete expression for the uh, velocity of A after the impact, and the same for the velocity of B. Okay. All right. I will not be doing any problems like this. So uh, they're not that hard, but it's just a little bit beyond. And we won't have any springs either. All right. And that's you know, it. Somebody made like a video game in school. They have to yes. include all those formulas. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep. If, if, if the universe of the video game acts like the real universe, everything's going to be determined by those formulas. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, yeah. and I was really, we had a, an incident um, out on our farm involving a, uh, this is how I found out about this, which I just thought was really cool, but involving a, a person who hit a cow that was out on the highway. And it was quite, it wasn't anybody that we were associated with, it was somebody else, I wanna be really clear. But it was quite late at night, and they suspected that he had been drinking. But he said, oh, I was, you know, um, I was just going 30 miles an hour or something like that. And they reconstructed it this way. And it turned out that he was going like 77 miles an hour. So, so, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. The guy lived, the cow did not. But anyway, I guess that's probably too much information. Not for you, but for other people. They might not want to know that. But it was not a very, it was not a pretty sight. So, but anyway. So I always love it when I find real world applications. You know, it's like hitting pool balls on a table is really cool, but when you find out that there are other things that you can do with it, it's much cooler. All right, so like I said, this will be our last lecture uh, for chapter 13. I will assign two more problems. Um, I'll try to find one that's a direct central impact and one that's an oblique impact, and I will put them up on our Moodle page. So this homework for chapter 13 will actually not be due till Monday, but as I've told you before, if you turn it in late, it's, there's really no penalty. The days are just to keep us on schedule so that you won't have a big clot of stuff to do before the midterm and the final. So the 
more progress you can make, the better off, but you won't lose credit for turning in anything late. All right, well, have a wonderful uh, day, and we will see you next time.